From the mountains of Utah to the East Bay of Northern California, this is the Green and Gold Podcast. Welcome everyone, my name is Adam Ames. I am the curator here at the unofficial Oakland Athletics YouTube channel. In this podcast, we will attempt to discuss the team from all vantage points and all eras. With me for this ride is my tag team partner, lifelong friend and ace fanatic, Michael Go. Well, thanks, Adam. Um, that's right. Uh, we've both been ace fans since we were little kids. Uh, it's something you and I have uh, loved for, gosh, I mean, you know, as long as I can remember. Uh, we both love baseball. We both especially love the A's, so it's great to be able to share this with everyone. For our first episode, what we're going to be talking about is the 50th anniversary team. And, of course, this comes with a lot of controversy. Anytime you have a fan vote of this type of magnitude, somebody's going to be on the outside looking in. Somebody is going to be upset that they didn't make it. Uh, you know, my favorite ace player didn't make it, but why is this guy going to make it? Who shouldn't be there, in your opinion? Oh, for sure. I mean, 50 greatest A's players, you expect the best of the best. And I admit, looking at the list, uh, there's probably a couple of people in there that made it just, you know, for sentimentality's sake for me. And this is kind of a tough one because I really liked him as, a, as an Oakland A during his time. Sean Doolittle. I got to admit, I, I wasn't sure why he was in there. Uh, there's not many relief pitchers on the list. Uh, he, he's up there with Raleigh Fingers and Dennis Eckersley. And then you've got Sean Doolittle. So, and I know he had some great years for us. Maybe for me, it's a little tainted. He was uh, not as effective and was very injury prone his last few years. I uh, still have really bad memories of the wild card game against the Kansas City Royals. I'm sure you do too. Uh, I, I think I still roll out of bed uh, in a panicked sweat when I remember or think about that game at all. So I try not to. But, uh, yeah, Sean being on the list of 50 greatest A's players as, uh, you know, as, as a big part of the bullpen as he was during the last run that we had in the postseason uh, kind of struck me as kind of odd. And I thought that somebody else could have been in that slot other than Sean. Do you think it has something to do with the fact of, you know, him being an A's fan when he was little and his, his kind of connection? Well, I mean, uh, Sean was a big personality. He had a big beard. Uh, there was a great promo they had when uh, so I think it was something Sean started in the bullpen where uh, the rookie pitchers would have to carry around a little pink backpack with a rainbow unicorn on it. Uh, they made it a nice little cool promo. Um, and he was a really uh, active personality in the community. Uh, so definitely a popular player. Uh so I think that has a lot to do with it. But just pure performance-wise, to put him in that list with just looking at Dennis Eckersley and Raleigh Fingers and Sean Doolittle, it just kind of sticks out, you know? I I, I think somebody else could have uh, been in there other than, than Sean. And I'm, I'm kind of thinking, if not him, then another relief pitcher. Um, I don't know. you have any relief pitchers you think of? You know, the, and Sean Doolittle, I, when, I can think of a couple. When the list was released, my mind immediately went to uh, Gene Nelson and Rick Honeycutt uh, because those were the two guys who were mainstays in the bullpen during the championship years of the late 80s. And they were a great compliment to Eckersley because you knew pretty much the game was over. I mean, setup men don't get the respect that I think they deserve. You know, they're kind of like, in a weird way, they're kind of like punters in the NFL. They come in for one play, a small part of the overall game, and then they're forgotten. That is completely ridiculous. I gotta I, admit, that's a pretty tough sell considering uh, they're both setup men. And, uh, you know, being relief pitchers, uh, um, closers get all the glory. But... Uh, and another thing that we have to um, kind of discuss a little bit about the list is that it wasn't a, okay, we're going to have two outfielders and two pitchers and two relievers and this and that. It was just the, the, the top 50 guys who got the most votes and 50 was the cutoff. That was top 50. So we're not talking about specifically people at particular positions. So I'm not entirely surprised that only, you know, three relievers or three bullpen guys, you know, if we want to do a blanket statement, made the cut. That's a little bit murky for me. So my two guys would be Honeycutt and Honeycutt over Nelson. So if I have to choose one to replace Doolittle, I'm going to choose Honeycutt. 
Interesting. Yeah, uh, Honey Cutter was a great lefty setup man. It, it, that was just a perfect bullpen. I think uh, La Russa really revolutionized the use of the bullpen back with those uh, 80s A's teams, late 80s A's teams with just that that specialized reliever for the one inning. You know, you got your lefty come on in the seventh or Nelson would come in for an inning in the eighth and then Eck would just wipe them out in the ninth inning in like nine pitches. That was something that uh, Tony really just popularized at the time. But uh, I'm just curious to see whether you, you remember any other worthwhile relief pitcher, any closers. Uh, Folk, uh, but he was only there for one year. That's I who mean, I was thinking of. I mean, what... well, and, and that's another thing I had a problem with, with the list is I had a hard time with guys who were there for a year. Or, you know, or even two years. It was like, you know, when you close your eyes and you think of the Oakland A's, do you really think of this player? And, you know, some people are going to and some people won't. So that's why I didn't really put Folk in there. You could, yeah, Jason another, Isringhausen, I mean. He was there for a few years, you're right. Yes, um, but he would, you know, watching Isringhausen, it just give you a heart attack every time. Every single time you would come in there and go, oh, gosh, please. Which is he ever going to get? Are we going to get the lights out three, you know, immaculate inning? Or are we going to have the bases loaded with two outs on a 3-2 pitch? Well, I'm sure you remember his back-to-back-to-back home runs against the New York Yankees. I, I, I don't remember who hit him, but I remember uh, maybe uh, Bernie Williams was definitely involved in justice. And that part of that Yankees lineup, he just basically gave up three home runs in a row to blow a save. But... Izzy, when he was on with that curveball and that fastball combination, he he was effective, and he was there for a few years. And then, as I said, uh, I don't blame you for not remembering a lot of uh, memorable closers because they didn't stick around for too long. I think uh, Billy Billy as in Billy Dean went through this period where he went through closers like a year. Yeah, he yeah. didn't really put a lot of value in that one inning. We had the good old Octavio Dotel for maybe a year or two. Um, and you and I, our personal favorite, Brian Fuentes. Uh, oh, yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, well, another guy comes to mind that uh, pitched for us for at least two or three years, I believe, Grant Balfour. Well, that was so, the, that was the 2000, 2012? That was, yeah, that was the, the 2012, 2013, 14 run. Yeah. The majority of the players, I think. I think maybe even all of the players in, in terms of uh, why they're there of course this is being subjective and the question you know is a personal one should he be there and I'm going to jump in and say Frank Thomas should not be on the team <laughs> All right, here I go. love Frank Thomas he is one of my top 10 all time players if they win the World Series in 2006 then maybe we have a discussion but his performance in the ALCS, he was 0 for 13. There are far more deserving age players who didn't make the list. So no, he doesn't belong. I don't know if you'll be surprised by my answer, but uh, I, I think he does belong. And I'll tell you why. And it's because I think that year when Frank joined, um, I was just, you know, just like you, uh, I was a big Frank Thomas fan. The guy was an incredible hitter, monstrous power hit for average he was just your just your prototypical triple crown guy and the way he played the game was just very professional you know you you really admire that and you don't see guys you don't see athletes play that way anymore uh to see him join the a's was a, a little you approach it with a little trepidation you you think to yourself oh this guy's at the end of his career he's just gonna he just wants to get a, a last paycheck. You know, play a couple more years, but he had an incredible year. I think he, I think he easily won comeback player of the year that year. Not to mention taking the A's all the way to the American League Championship Series, which we hadn't approached in a long time. Frank became a, a fan favorite easily. Uh, I understand what you mean by not by him not being a long time A, or and in addition to that being more identified with another team, the White Sox, right? When you think of Frank Thomas, you think of the White Sox, not the A's. 
So I can understand why you don't think he belongs on, on any greatest list for the A's, especially when you compare him to the rest of the first basemen that are on the list also, Maguire and, and um, Jason Giambi. And, well, maybe I'll leave you to talk about the fourth guy on that first, first baseman list later on. Uh, oh, no, Ch- we can talk about him right now. Oh, well, I mean, yeah. yeah, there is four, four first basemen on that list. So like, um, well, here, here's the question. Again, yeah. again, being subjective. And again, being you know why they are on the list. Uh-huh. But then another question you may have to ask yourself was simply of, can one hit put you on a list of greatest whatever that is okay so i mean it's it's throughout baseball it's not just the a's mm-hmm. we're talking about luis gonzalez against the yankees you know so is luis gonzalez an all-time diamondback is ishikawa an all-time san francisco giant for what he did to the cardinals getting them to the world series uh, uh, is, 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 <laughs> is is mazarowski you know as great of a defensive player he was for the pirates he's known for the the home running um to beat the yankees Scott Hatterberg. Now look, no disrespect to Scott Hatterberg, but in my opinion, he doesn't belong in the same ballpark with guys like Reggie Jackson and Dennis Eckersley and Ricky Henderson. It was a legendary home run, a tremendous moment. There's no denying that at all. But the fact of the matter is there are other players who have meant more to the organization. So that goes back to the question is, can one hit put you on an all-time list? It's a really interesting question because... You're right about the one hit. If he did not get that just ultra-dramatic game-winning home run for that winning streak, we we would hardly remember Scott Hatterberg other than being a money ball player, you know? But he did. He did hit that home run, and... And you mentioned a lot of greats that have that are that, that didn't really have stellar careers, but you remember them for the one play. Baseball is so much about that one moment, so much anticipation. You know, the, the pace of baseball is so much different from other sports, so that every one moment is magnified. You, you remember even the bad plays. Buckner, that's what he's going to be remembered for. I think the same case kind of happened with with Hatterberg as as far as this list. Uh, he he, in, in that one moment with that one swing, he just kind of catapulted himself to being an an A's hero of sorts because the twenty game win streak is is one of the greatest moments in this franchise. Well, not only was it I mean was it that moment? I mean, obviously it was that moment, but it was the way the game had gone. Sure, I mean, you're up. 10 to nothing, was it? it Some, 11, 11 to nothing. And, and then Kansas one. City comes back, bounces back and forth, and then, you know, Hatterberg comes up and, and makes that hit. So, again, I know why he's on the list. I mean, if so if we're taking guys off the list, who are we putting back on? And there are two particular guys who I'm just, I'm flabbergasted at the fact that they're not on the list, and that's Tony Armas and Mike Bordick. How in the world is Mike Bordick? I can maybe understand Tony Armas because he played during an era where, you know, you're talking about the younger voters. To not have Mike Bordick on that list, who, you know, he was an average at best guy uh, at the plate, but he was a solid defender. He was, Mike Gallego was on the list. How is Mike Bordick not on the list? I totally agree with you. Uh, Mike Bordick was just solid to the core. Um, he can hit close to 300 at one point, but his his fielding was solid. He didn't have the greatest range of shortstops, but sure-handed. Right? He he will make the routine plays, and he he played for the A's for a good amount of time before he over played. 800 games. That's a that's a good that's a good player to replace somebody like a one moment player like Hatterberg. Uh, so kudos to you for that. I, I haven't thought about Mike Bordick in a long while, and maybe one of the reasons why we don't really think of him is because he didn't really play on a winning A's team. The early '90s teams, so probably right around 1993 upwards to 1998, those were very poor teams, and they had awful records. But at the same time, they had tremendous offenses. 
They had Matt Stairs, who, you know, some people would say, hey, how come Matt Stairs isn't on that list? Geronimo yeah. Barora. Yeah, when, you, when you're not winning, that's, that. as I said, you know, baseball is a game of moments. And when you're 500 or under, you just don't have a lot of those moments, even if you're putting together numbers that are pretty solid. Uh, Tony Armas, I think this is, uh, again, maybe a case where they didn't really have that kind of Hatterberg moment or even a Thomas season. He was just, he played good solid ball for a few years and then moved on to another team. Well, but with Armas, he hit almost 30 home runs for four years in a row during the early 80s, during a time where it was Billy Ball. So it's not like this guy's some kind of a jobber. I mean, if you compare him to Thomas, Thomas had one great season. Armas had four. We've made it to the halfway point of the show, and that means it's time for the A's ad break. A lot of us are in the social media these days, so we thought we'd try to get the coaches into it. And you tweeted. Are there any questions? Bob? Can I blog for uh, my blueberry? Yeah, I really wouldn't do that. How do you butt dial? Can I retweet myself? No, don't, don't do that. Where's the photobomb button? What? Print sandwich. Look, this cat's playing piano. <laughs> Print sandwich. Last season, I taught the coaches about social media. They still have a lot to learn. Should I post a photo with one of those number sign things on it? You mean a hashtag? Sure. So someone said cookies are bad. How could cookies be bad? Well, how do I make a duck face? You should never make a duck face. Even if you're sending a selfie? I think you mean selfie. I pinned a Snapchat on my Instagram GIF and tweeted it to my Tumblr page. What? Before I hand out your social media diplomas, I'd like to review what we've learned. Bob? You wouldn't poke anybody in real life, so don't poke them on Facebook. Good. Kurt? Never accept a friend request from a woman you don't know who's way too attractive to be lonely. Very good. Wash, you got anything? Oh, sorry. My duck face selfie is trending on Twitter. He is the new guy. The moment players. Does Dallas Braden get that list if he doesn't throw the perfect game? No. Uh, if he hadn't thrown the perfect game, he would be best known for uh, throwing a tantrum at uh, Alex Rodriguez for stepping over the mound. <laughs> and uh, uh, that was a great moment for all A's fans because... Well, nobody, uh, we, nobody because, here liked Alex Rodriguez anyway. Exactly. And that, I think that's exactly what Dallas said at the time. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Take me through that after you turned that double play you guys did in the sixth inning. It looked like some words were exchanged between you and A-Rod. What was going on? Uh, well, uh, you know, it's it, it's a shame because that guy's a tremendous talent, uh, to, you know, a superstar in every sense of the word. Plays for a very classy organization who always do things first class the right way every time. And uh, for him to not understand the baseball etiquette of running across that pitcher's mound is right next to terrible and inexcusable. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a spec on his radar, and that's fine, but uh, he will know I was out there, and he will know to not do that again because there will be repercussions if it happens again. You know, we weren't a very good team, and here comes the Yankees, you know, the, the New York Yankees, uh, and to, just to see somebody, anybody on the team put up any sort of fight and not take anything from these guys, just, it, it's a good feeling uh, as a fan. I do believe that uh, you know, and, and maybe and maybe this is hypocritical. Uh, it probably is, but you know, because I I knocked Frank Thomas for oh he had a great season. Well, Dallas Braden had a great game, and and I kind of think that Braden belongs more than Thomas belongs. So uh, I, I, I you know why. yeah, D Dallas. When you think of an Oakland Athletic, Dallas was an Oakland Athletic through and through. You know who uh, who really surprised me. Nick Swisher. I didn't think people would vote for him. Yeah, I mean, uh, Swish was uh, a good player when he started out with the A's in terms of putting up some power numbers, and and uh, I don't think his average was spectacular, but he definitely had the power. He was uh, he he was sort of a scrappy little guy, um, but I think for 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 Swisher, one of the main draws for him was he had this really huge outgoing personality you know the long hair and just really energetic and you know how much uh personality matters you know it, for for just you know kind of your normal uh, sports fan well that's uh, why steven votes on the list right i would say so 
Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying that is a bad thing. I, I agree that Stephen Vogt uh, made enough when he was there and just his story and, and all of the stuff that, that goes along with him. I'm just using him as an example of somebody who had a larger than life kind of a personality who connected with the fans, who connected with the, the media and the team in general. And that's why people remember him. You know, we watch sports, uh, not just for the sport itself, but uh, we want to be entertained. And it, it's it's nice to be able to see some of these guys uh, go out there with a really unique personality and and go out and play ball, but still, you know, provide you with that kind of uniqueness that you don't see in, in any other uh, player that you can watch. Here is the Street Fighter Mortal Kombat battle, if you will. I see that as Kurt Suzuki against Ramon Hernandez. Kurt Suzuki versus Ramon Hernandez. That's kind of an odd one. I think Ramon would be perfectly at home on this list. I'd be hard-pressed to say whether he should kick out Suzuki because Kurt was a longtime catcher for the A's. He, he put up some fairly decent offensive numbers for a catcher early on, but he was just one of those kind of everyday backstops and we all know how hard it is to catch almost every day and he was that guy so that's how i remember him as and that's why i would i i didn't blink twice when i saw him on this list but when you bring up ramon hernandez and we're talking about moments here you know against the bunt against the red sox yeah the the walk the walk-off bunt was is you know one of those moments and even just talking about numbers, he, he put up some, some good offensive numbers for a catcher. I think Ramon Hernandez meant more to the A's than Kurt Suzuki did. Uh, you know, going back to what you were talking about earlier with the, uh, you know, playing on poor teams. Kurt Suzuki played on a, on a lot of poor teams during his, his run, but I mean, that doesn't have anything to do with his p- performance in particular. But overall, my opinion, I think uh, Ramon Hernandez meant more to the early 2000s teams than Suzuki did to the uh, A's teams when he played. Do you feel Chris Davis and Sonny Gray should be part of that? Yes, I I do believe they belong. You know, you can't deny what Sonny Gray has meant to this team, uh, especially the way he started out in uh, that Detroit postseason series. Um, I remember watching that game and the crowd just chanting sunny sunny that was just incredible to say that his time in oakland didn't deserve this kind of recognition i think it does and it's just a shame that it was derailed by a few injuries Uh, i I think he would have had even better numbers if he didn't again as we talked about you know a, a lot of times lists like these get created on on moments uh sunny at the very least didn't just have one moment he had a few. I think Davis belongs more than Sonny does because, and that's kind of surprising for me to say, but uh, <laughs> the, the, the fact that the, the fact is he did something that no other athletic had ever done before. 40 homers in two consecutive seasons. I could not believe it. And I spent the better part of two or three hours because I, I couldn't believe it. I, I, my math is wrong. So I went through era by era. I went from 1968 to 2017. And I could not believe that nobody, no athletic had hit 40. McGuire, absolutely he hit 40 home runs two years in a row. I mean, go down the list of power hitters for the A's in history. You got Canseco didn't do it. Reggie Jackson didn't do it. Dave Kingman didn't do it. I mean, I I was shocked. That is shocking. You're right. Um... You know, especially if you do it in a ballpark like the Coliseum. It's pretty impressive. It's like uh, winning the batting title in the Coliseum. <laughs> what? Carney, Carney. Carney almost. Could have done it if it weren't for Kirby Puckett. <clears throat> yeah, you're right. Uh, Chris also deserves to be on this list. Uh, surprising for me to say. Um, again, it's kind of a personality thing. Chris Davis is a pretty quiet guy. And you don't usually think of that of big power hitters and he's not it's another thing he's not a big lumbering you know adam dunn jim tomey type power hitter he's pretty small statured guy he generates all his power with his legs and 
and he hits these really interesting looking home runs to the opposite field but he hits them and he hits them a lot uh, so it, it's pretty impressive what he has done and as definitely as a as a star in an Oakland A's team he he deserves on to be on this list there was one guy on this list that made me do a double take and that was Kurt Young I noticed that too yeah uh, I I mean was he because he was a he's been a coach forever is that I mean his performance was I mean he had some pretty good years in the late 80s I do believe that this election of this list is more tied to the fact that he's been he was the ace pitching coach for so long after I took a couple of minutes to kind of think about how how long he's been there and and really what he's meant to the organization and you kind of have to think okay well Maybe that makes sense. Let's talk about the last batch of guys here before we go ahead and close out the show. The uh, 2012 to uh, 2014 teams. Uh, how did you feel about guys like Donaldson and Cespedes and Reddick on the team? Do you think they belong? Those guys, along with Josh Reddick, who is thankfully on this list, uh, defined this latest A's team and their latest postseason run. That was their team. That was Reddick's team. That was Cespedes' team. That was Donaldson's team. And that was Sean Doolittle's team. To have that tie to that team on this list uh, represented is, is a good thing. And, and, and it's well-deserved in my book. To as, do- much, as much as we've spent the last hour or so complaining about who belongs there and who belongs I believe I think you're right. I think... Uh, the fact that guys like Bill North made that list, you know, Ken Holtzman, I was, I was very happy to see Ken Holtzman on that list because he is the guy who gets lost between catfish and blue moon and, and Raleigh. I was very pleased to see Tony Phillips on this list. He is a player who doesn't get talked about nearly enough. Uh, you, he could play almost everywhere on the field. Uh, he was solid at the plate. He was a great, great defender. And I'm so glad he's on this list. I think that's it for me. We could be here for another several hours discussing the head scratchers and discussing the guys who made it, the guys who didn't. But overall, you know, I think they did a pretty decent job. Uh, what are your final thoughts, Mike? As oftentimes as you, as you and I talk about lists that are totally voted on by fans, this is not a bad list. It's very well represented. And even some of the borderline votes, you can see why. And... I'm just really happy that they did this in the first place so that current generations of fans can see that the, the team has had a long history of really great all-time players. Yep, we've, we've had some good ones. We've been lucky enough to see them. And hopefully we'll be lucky enough to talk about more. But for right now, we are out. <laughs>